is our history. Buildings and people and memories and dreams. Who better to tell us than those who were there? There's so much to learn from the stories they'll share. Living history. Living history. Hello, I'm Ted Goldsboro, and this is another segment of Living History. Today we have with us General Julius Becton who is a graduate of Lower Marion High School in the class of 1944. We had a segment last month, and this is our second segment to review. We talked about General Brechton's childhood in Bryn Mawr and going through Bryn Mawr Grammar School <laughs> and Ardmore Junior High School with Ed Snow and Lower Marion High School. General Becton graduated, as I said, in 1944, and he almost immediately uh, signed up in the summer of 1944 with his mother uh, taking him down into Philadelphia. Uh, he was, I guess, 18 years old, signed up for the Army Air Corps, I hope that's correct. And so we're going to continue talking about uh, General Becton's military career for a little bit. Can I make one correction? Yes, sir. I signed, I joined the Army Air Corps Enlisted Reserve when I was 17. December the 28th. Okay. Six of us went down after a fellow named oh. Hap Arnold came out to our <laughs> high school and gave us a long song and dance about joining the Army Air Corps and winning your silver wings and gold bar. Oh. So we went down. A lot more went down, but six of us okay. signed up. And you mentioned in your book that uh, the Civil Air Patrol, I think? I was a member of the Civil Air Patrol because they came into our school, Laura Mary, and conducted classes mm. and court the uh, Mm. Let's say the school gave them space for that, mm -hmm. but the CAP actually did the instruction and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I did quite well, particularly navigation and uh, CAR, Civil Air Nautical Regulations. Mm. Did not do as well as I should have done on some other mm -hmm. aspects of flying. But that might have encouraged you oh, to, did. Okay, to go on with the a Army Air Corps. Which is why I joined the Army uh, Air Corps, okay, okay. so I could become a pilot okay. and become a second lieutenant. With the Tuskegee Airmen. And of course, that's the only place I could go. That's how yeah. it. Because of being black. There was no other place we could. Matter yeah. of fact, the six of us signed up the 28th of December, 43. When we graduated, five went to Florida to different bases. I went to Mississippi. I understand that you've heard of Biloxi, <laughs> Mississippi. I know Biloxi. Okay, I just <laughs> want to point that out. <laughs> Chiefsler Field. Yes, sir. Are you telling me that there could not be a black officer in the Army Air Corps unless you went through the Tuskegee Airmen? I will put At it this that way. Time. Tuskegee was the only place that were training black Americans to fly. Jeez. No other place. Now you mentioned Hap Arnold. And again, for those who don't know Lower Marion, who was Hap Arnold? Hap Arnold was a graduate of uh, Lord Marion class, so I think 1903 or 1905. Oh, three it is. And uh, he later stayed in the Army. He went to West Point and then got into flying business. And when the war started, World War I, World War II, excuse me, he was the chief of staff for the Army Air Corps. And he was the one who, as I said, encouraged a lot of us to go to flight school. He mm -hmm. came to his high school and where he graduated mm -hmm. and gave us a long song and dance about, ah, this is the way we need <laughs> And uh, one of the problems I found out much, much later that uh, he was tied to some policies of the War Department, then called War Department, about a study that came out in 1925, Army War College study, that said that black Americans they didn't say that, that the Negroes could not uh, use initiative, they could not follow orders, they could not handle technical equipment, and there's a whole list of things that they could not do. And mm -hmm. as a result, anyone who in the Army back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s 
they came up with that statement, that mm -hmm. policy. Okay, we were behind eight ball before we got started. Were there some African American military officers in the 30s and 40s, 20s, 30s, and 40s? Two. <sighs> that uh, I, let me qualify that. Two line officers. We had a doctor, and we had a couple of chaplains. Just it's uh, very difficult to to comprehend. Now, when we were talking last month, uh, we talked about a man who was from <laughs> Bryn Mawr. <laughs> and could you tell me about Chief Anderson? Chief Anderson was a, he grew up, as far as I knew, in, in Bryn Mawr. His parents worked on the same side of the track that I lived on. And I, I his father may have been a coachman? That's correct. And I never, he was much older than I, but um, we knew that he was interested in flying. We knew that he was flying. And did I ever get a chance to ride with him? No. But uh, as history tells us, before World War II started, he had moved to Tuskegee uh, as an instructor because they wanted to have aviation as part of the program, and that's the only place he could go, and mm -hmm. he went down. And so when the Army Air Corps were convinced that you're going to start training black Americans to fly, Tuskegee was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chief Anderson was the senior instructor, and he did a great thing for the benefit of black Americans in that Eleanor Roosevelt, first lady, in those days, visited Tuskegee and she wanted to fly. Okay, he volunteered to be the driver mm -hmm. and her escorts screamed about it. She got calls from Washington, they screamed, you can't do that. <laughs> now if you know anything about Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> she's not <laughs> the one you say, you can't do this, <laughs> as I understand. She took him up. Good, good. And he flew around. And that changed the history of black it, people it, in it, aviation. It, it made it possible. In the military because that in itself proved that he could fly, black America mm -hmm. could fly, and look at the first lady is yeah, riding. Yeah, but she gets credit for going down there and asking him to do it. She gets credit for doing that. Yeah. Um, could you tell me, is there is uh, Chief Anderson's granddaughter, what, what's up with that? Uh, she is trying to establish a, a memorial uh, recognizing her grandfather, what he did. There is a f campaign now to raise fun money for that purpose. Um, I would encourage anybody who's interested to go to www.chiefanderson.com and they can, you'll find there what one can do or should do if they're interested in that program. Thank you for that. Uh, Christina, Christine Anderson, the granddaughter, came to the Lower Historical Society last spring and she was interested in information about where her father was a coachman, and it was called Miss Wright School, which now Bryn Mawr College has its dormitory. But for many years, like Shipley and Baldwin, Miss Wright had a school to, to prepare girls to go to Bryn Mawr College. Yep. Uh, during the Second World War, there was a shop teacher at Laura Marion named Mr. Byerly, and could you tell me how he was connected with uh, military people? Russ Byerly set up a repository, I guess the best way of putting it, to encourage any student, particularly those that he knew, to write. Tell him what they're doing, and he would publish it in a news, in a type of newsletter. And uh, I found out that uh, he not only encouraged it, but he also kept files. And I have found in that file at the guess at the um, historical the historical <laughs> society letters written by my mother <laughs> to him yeah. about what I was doing, <laughs> and I must tell you I had no idea that she had done that. Yeah. Yep. There it is. And, and look at the penmanship too, by the way. It's yeah. not bad for her. She went to yeah. the tenth grade. Oh. Well, you mentioned in your book that 
after you came home from school, the first job was homework. If you want to do anything else in a family, like listen to the radio or going out and play or what, you did your homework first. Mm. And as a matter of fact, um, I was pretty good at football, but in order for me to play football, Dick Mattis would have to come to my house and talk to my mother wow. and get her signature because wow. Dad wouldn't sign for it. Oh. He wouldn't say she couldn't do it, but yeah. he wouldn't say. Wow. But he would go see her every summer. Gee. Mrs. Beckton was time. I didn't know where, that. and she assigned. Wow, I didn't know that. Now these are uh, for the television audience. These are a couple <laughs> letters that General Beckton wrote in 1945, yep. and May and September. Um, we have a, a colored picture here, and uh, what's that from, General Beckton? You know, you probably don't want to use the term colored picture. Uh, sorry. <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> Technicolor. <laughs> no. Picture and color. This happens to be a picture of cover of my book. Well, uh, what What is that book? It, the title is Beckton, Autobiography of a Soldier and a Public Servant. And this was, I started this book in 19 and... 92, and I finished it in 2007. Slow learner. No, it had a lot to tell. Well, mm -hmm. it, it's, it was interesting. I had enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm satisfied with it. And I just got word, which you may or may not know, uh, last two weeks ago, I got the word that they're going to make an ebook out of it. Oh, good. And that would obviously. Uh -huh. Kids are used to ebooks now, yes. as opposed to going and buying a hard copy. Yeah, so they'll be able to read it online. Yeah. Okay. Now we're we're getting close to a break here, but uh, there's a picture of two people, and I wonder if you could tell me who they are. Well, I I think the the fellow standing behind has a turtleneck on, <laughs> and, and the lady in front is my wife. Oh, so it must be you and your wife. That's right, and. That was done, I think, we visited the Historical Society. That's right. And That's right. just for the record, we have been married. We celebrated our 65th anniversary oh. in January. Oh, isn't that nice? Now, we've got to take a, a break here. We'll be right back after we take a break.